Hello everyone, this is Vikram Prakash and you are yet once again listening to Architecture Talk, a podcast dedicated to advancing the frontier of architectural thinking via conversations with a series of contemporary thinkers. I have been taking a break for a while over the summer and early fall here in 2023 and now I am back with a new season. We have several new episodes already recorded and I will be bringing them to you. But we are going to begin this season first by a rebroadcast of my conversation with Anthony Widler. Perhaps some of those of you who are in the architecture and architectural history profession, particularly here in the United States and Europe, will have heard that this past summer we suffered a series of significant setbacks with a number of distinguished historians passing away, which include George Bird, Jean-Louis Cohen, and Anthony Widler. Jean-Louis Cohen's passing was an absolute shock to me. He was a young person and one of the most warm and hospitable human beings that I ever met. He will be missed, as will also be missed is Tony Widler, who was a close, close friend, a dear mentor to me, and in whose footsteps I have in many ways tried to walk and continue to walk today. As we start off this new season, I therefore am happy to bring to you this recording that I did with him more than a year ago, which I hope you will enjoy. Much more coming up. Here we go. Here's remembering you, Tony. Architecture is really the art and science of turning fiction into fact. Sometimes uh, kind of real architectural life interferes with intellectual architectural life. There is no such thing as architecture. Hello everyone, this is Vikram Prakash and you are listening to Architecture Talk. Each episode we try and have a conversation with a contemporary thinker to advance the frontier of architectural thinking. Today I am talking with my good friend and colleague Anthony Widler, who has of course a distinguished career in the Architectural Academy as an architectural historian and as a critic and dean of the Cooper Union School of Architecture. I was over in New York for a day uh, and met Anthony uh, at his home and uh, what you're going to hear is simply uh, a conversation that we had essentially over dinner and wine. We talk about a variety of things, we talk about contemporary practice, we talk of the nature of architectural history today and we talk about his life and career. Uh, I love this conversation, a lot of fun in recording it and I hope you enjoy it. Let's first access the wine. Anyway, cheers. That's the best thing. Cheers. Wonderful to have so you. So good. Home. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me back. It's always such a pleasure to come to New York. Well, I'd have you back more often if you came more often. But uh, well, we'll have to have you to the finals of the thesis reviews uh, in the spring. I would love to come. Which is uh, something that, uh, for some reason, because I've been out of the picture for so long, has not been uh, replicated often enough. And, and, you know, I love the Cooper thesis reviews, and I tell everyone about them. It's thought through, it's sort of referenced, it is sort of connected to the discourse and histories of architecture, not, not as sort of precedent study or any right. of that, but as sort of living culture of uh, architectural thinking. I think that um, you spoke of Cooper as not being totally involved in historical precedent, mm-hmm. but also involved in the sort of intellectual thinking through mm-hmm. of a problematic, right, uh, right. which relates to a design and to a, a question in the universe or a question in the world. Right. And I think uh, that's true. Um, and I think Cooper actually has always, from the time of, uh, certainly from the time when Haydock took over mm-hmm. as, as uh, chair and then as dean, mm-hmm. has always resisted because he took over as chair and dean in the, in the 60s and then he became dean in 75. Um, always resisted 
the kind of history that postmodernism right. was delivering. Right, 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 right. So he may have had a tremendously powerful uh, connection to a kind of history of the modern movement, right. a kind of history of architecture. Yeah. But it was not the history that was being delivered by so-called postmodernism. Right, right. It was a history that uh, was much more abstract, mm -hmm, much right. more empathetic in relationship to spatial organization right. than it was to historical quotation. Right. right, right. And so I think now the emphasis on, on precedent is a kind of a fill-in for loss, if you want. Right, a kind right. Of, uh, a sense of how how can we recuperate history without recuperating um, the kind of postmodernism of quotation and citation? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so precedent has to be therefore a question of abstracting from uh, a typological universe. Right, right, right. right. And it is true that um, when people like myself in the seventies were involved in questions of typology. It was precisely a resistance, a, a, a kind of abstraction of architectural prototypes mm -hmm. in such a way as to resist historical quotation. Right, 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 right. In the same way that we learned from Colin Rowe that uh, it would be nice to envisage Corbusier playing with Palladio in an abstract way, yeah, yeah. And transforming his uh, centralization into a peripheral organization. Uh -huh. uh, in order to counter the very literal uh, quotations that were emerging in uh, the 70s and 80s yeah. after, uh, after uh, Portuguese's uh, um, uh, Venetian uh, extravaganza of the, of the La Strada Novissima yeah. in 80, 80, 81, 82. Somewhere there, yeah. Um, that we were much more interested in in recuperating the abstraction of mm -hmm. history right. than we were recuperating the uh, the signs of history. Right, right. Which were, I think, very much a product of the uh, of the rather over literal assimilation of structural semiology in architecture mm -hmm. as a kind of theory of meaning. Right, which right. I think. Baird and Jenks were totally involved in at the right, time sure. in the seventies, uh, where they were. We were trying to sort of counter this. Let's search for the semiotic element. Right, uh, right, let's right. Search for the meaningful element in historical uh, discourse, which became very literal. Mm -hmm, right, mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. Palladian facade of uh, um, of Venturi's mother's house, for right, example. Right, which I actually find much more abstract than much later postmodernism of, uh, of the gentleman that you know. <laughs> let's, let's leave it at that. <laughs> Since they're all friends of mine. <laughs> uh, you know, what do you think about the valence of thinking in the era of, you know, climate change and sustainability and sort of this extremely technologized and urgent well, I think it's both technologized and it's uh, it's still Hegelian. In <laughs> other words, it has this extraordinary effect of the big narrative. Yeah, yeah. So the big narrative that was progress in the Enlightenment, the big yeah. narrative that was uh, the Hegelian dialectics of uh, of uh, historical development towards a kind of philosophical community that was in Hegel that got adopted as the kind of structure. The structure of, of academic history, right, uh, in art history and in all other uh, histories, uh, I still think that the uh, that the chrono chronological narratives of the Anthropocene, the chronological narratives of the uh, of the catastrophe theories in relationship to climate change, mm -hmm. which I think are absolutely. <laughs> Correct, of course, and 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 certainly worthy of complete panic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, are in fact obscuring the possibilities of any form of mediatory action in the present. Okay, uh, what do you mean by that mediatory well, action example, in the present? For example, you know there was a very nice little uh, piece in Eflux uh, the day before yesterday. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was even yesterday uh -huh. by um, a small group of uh, architects and thinkers. Uh, who were working between Eastern Europe and uh, 
uh, Rotterdam and Vienna uh, in terms of thinking through what we do as architects as we are living the catastrophe and not awaiting the catastrophe. Right, 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 right. You think it, it sort of uh, I think uh, circumcises the agency? I think we already yeah, in the have catastrophe. already been in the catastrophe. For a while, yeah. Or since industrialization. Okay. 1800. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think, in fact, we've always been already in the catastrophe. Uh, and that we have, we've enabled certain populations to survive well right, in right. terms of uh, uh, political well, influence, economic influence, and technological um, sophistication. Uh -huh. uh, we, we no longer are worried, not quite as worried as we were in Manchester, as Engels was, right. in terms of smoke pollution. Uh -huh. uh, we're not? You're well, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're no longer as worried. Yeah, right? okay. But about um, the same. But yeah. we are certainly worried in yeah. Mumbai. Yeah, of course. And, and uh, LA, yeah. Not just smoke pollution, pollution of every other kind. Yeah, too. of course, of course. You, you burn off the crops. The crops have been uh, have been anesthetized by, uh, by chemicals, and the chemicals come back to haunt us in the city. So you're saying this is an old, old discourse? Totally. It's been totally. And I, I think, in a way, that the discourse of progress and the discourse of Hegelian dialectic is a discourse that was def a defensive discourse right, right. against something that was already there. Yeah. Right? yeah. And I think, in a way, the first uh, intimations of this sense of living the catastrophe yeah. are in something like Voltaire's essay on the Lisbon earthquake. Or um, you know, Dieter Unpa Rose. unpack that for us. For Voltaire's what? essay on the Lisbon earthquake. Well, yeah. how can how can we live under a god that uh, rages so powerfully uh -huh. against us in nature? I mean, yeah, what, yeah, yeah. what is the relationship of nature <coughs> if nature revolts so strongly yes, against yes. us yes. while we ourselves what are living in nature? Yes. Right? It's the beginning of uh, vol vol you know, volcano research. It's the beginning of, right. of what, what happened to Pompeii. Right, nobody, right. Never, nobody ever thought of what happened to Pompeii right, until right. the Lisbon earthquake. Right, right. right? I so see. For me, yes, for, yes. Me, uh, for me, modernity is mm -hmm. uh, the defensive realization mm -hmm. that we are already on a course to a, a kind of auto destruction whether or not we know when it will be or whether or not we know what it will be right uh, we know that it's not going to be kind yes okay if that's the case then what is the project of utopia i mean what are we what are we fighting utopia for is precise no i think the project of utopia is precisely on the one hand as in in thomas more it's a project of of idealizing colonialization Mm. of idealizing how one might in fact construct worlds uh, outside the worlds we know mm -hmm. uh, but which uh, can in fact be constructed according to rules that uh, uh, well Robinson Crusoe knew exactly how to do it uh -huh. uh, he established a nice little colonial uh, operation <laughs> of on course right on that out of, uh, person <laughs> man Fred man Friday's uh, first enslavement right so I, I don't know. I, so I, you're totally cynical about this utopian I'm not project? Cynical. Oh, okay. I'm historically critical. All right. <laughs> it cannot be cynical about it. Yes. No. Okay. Utopia doesn't mean anything else but no place. Yeah. So sure. no place is just imagining whatever you want to imagine is yeah. going to happen. No, but you're in saying it's a place. specific. It's a colonial site. I think so. Yeah. yeah. And it, it was actually demonstrated by the missionaries in uh, Paraguay, for example, where they actually attempted to set up. Uh, Moore's utopian civilization. It's also the ethos of America, is it not? Mm. I mean, America itself. Uh, of course. Yeah. Of course. It's, it's a settlement. Uh, basically, utopia is a settlement plan. Yeah. 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 If you go back to Plato, there's nothing in Plato that's not about Greek expansion. Mm. Defense, defense of uh, Athens and Athenian control of its provinces at a moment when that control is breaking down and the, under the uh, under the threat of the Persian Empire. So you think the entire modernist narrative and ethos and ethic of progress is Hegelian? No, I think the narrative that is uh, that Hegel constructed a narrative 
that allowed for intellectuals to understand uh, chronology as having a kind of motive, as opposed to just being one day after the next. Okay. Well, I mean, the dialectic of uh, of history for Hegel is is towards a uh, is is a is a movement in if you take the aesthetics for example you have the aesthetics which starts off with uh, an architecture which is uh, as he ca calls it the symbolic moment uh -huh. uh, where a stone which has never been called anything else or has never been called anything before it's a stone mm -hmm. it doesn't exist before it's called a stone mm -hmm. uh, is shaped mm -hmm. and called something else an altar right or a temple right uh, which leads to the possibility of building a big stone like a pyramid which means the possibility of inhabiting that as a as a place to uh, bury the dead mm -hmm. which leads to the possibility of uh, building more stones which you inhabit in order to worship the gods uh, which in leads to the his apotheosis which is the romantic moment where there's a, uh, a cathedral where the community of the Christian church can worship mm -hmm. where the um, the form of the cathedral and the form of the worship and the form of the community are at one at which point uh, with a little bit of help from philosophers, you don't need that anymore either. So, so to bring it back to the present, if, if you're theorizing you know, contemporary practice which articulates itself as a response to the urgency <coughs> of climate change, as a part of the you know, uh, repetitious Hegelian dialectic of, uh, of the crisis of modernity, let's just say for shorthand, right. then that's the narrative structure. That, that's the narrative in, structure. In so but what is agency live, in, in this in case? In which we're taught to live. In which we're taught to live. So what is architectural agency? Well, precisely. This precisely. I feel that <coughs> the uh, that the concentration, uh, I think, is important for students. I think it's important for all of us to, to register the fact that we're living within that narrative, uh -huh. uh, that we're living the catastrophe. We, the catastrophe is not going to come. It's not about to come. Yeah. It's already with us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So that the catastrophe has to uh, be lived in such a way. I mean, Donna Haraway has has, sure. uh, has developed one form of, of understanding of uh, living with the troubles. Right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I would say that the problem is with architecture is that architecture has always had uh, a narrative which has an agency within its discipline. Mm -hmm. uh, from Vitruvius to the repetition of Vitruvius and the reduplication and the transformation of Vitruvius in the Renaissance all the way through. Mm -hmm. It has it. It has its historical uh, uh, roots and it has its historical continuous transformations. Uh -huh, right? uh -huh. So that uh, that uh, Boza um, transformation of uh, an 18th century uh, Vitruvian discourse can be understood in t compositional terms, which mm -hmm. then in compositional terms can be transformed into uh, taking historical types and recomposing them mm -hmm. so that we can still see someone like uh, Jim Sterling in the Leicester Engineering Building right. uh, looking at Melnikoff and using Melnikoff and right. thinking he's part of a tradition, right. but also some uh, I thinking also, and he writes this, of, of, of uh, comp making more complex and more um, uh, immediate uh, the language of modernity, the right, language right, of modern right. architecture. So having, I think, lost that particular connection to a historical discipline, we're now plunged into the big narrative right. Right? and we are given various technological apparatuses to, yeah. to either counter the narrative or to analyze, analyze the narrative. Yeah. Right? And I don't think that that's enough for architecture. Mm. And I think that we're in a moment now where we have to actually scale down. Scale uh, down? Yes. What do you mean? We have to scale down. We have to understand that architecture is not going to solve a crisis that, uh, or a catastrophe that we're living in. Right, right, but, right. Uh, uh, but, it, but it has a role sure, sure. in mediating, the, on the one hand, the extraordinary power of the technological instruments that are being uh, put together by cooperatives and by engineers and by scientists in order to counter the catastrophe, 
there's not a single architect in those uh, in those cooperatives. Okay. Uh, and so you're saying that's that's the appropriate site for that uh, response. What I'm saying, well, that could be it. Could be one of the interesting things about the uh, little efflux article I read uh, day before yesterday uh. is that they are talking about yes, they're living in a catastrophe. What can you do? You can't just sit back and you can't develop business as usual. You have to establish uh, resistance in relationship to cooperating with a, a group of resistors who mm -hmm. are in localities right. and at the same time try to enter the, dis <coughs> the discussion uh, as architects and designers of the uh, engineers and the technologists who are claiming that they are going to be able to solve the crisis. So architects as citizens, as, as community members, and also as uh, you know, providers of partial as, solutions. As designers. As designers, yes. yeah. So as I was particularly moved uh, when I went to Yale in April for a symposium uh, which brought a, a group of, uh, of experts and uh, architects uh, around uh, the Japanese uh, condition uh, from Hiroshima to Fukushima. Uh -huh. um, it was something like uh, resistance and resilience okay. as, a, as a symposium. Okay. And I was particularly moved by uh, the narratives of uh, the group Bow Wow that came. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and who talked about the way in which they had uh, been energized to um, enter the territory of uh, after the. Fukushima nuclear and tsunami. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Finding a community which was a survival community, which is a, which was the shattered pieces of communities uh -huh. that had bonded already together because the the the, uh, the bureaucracy had been completely slow and ineffectual and so on. They'd already bonded for bonded for survival in mm -hmm. the way in which they mm -hmm. found and sourced. Uh, goods that were stored somewhere else and mm -hmm, where mm -hmm. grocers, uh, little grocers said, yeah, we have a, a, a depot back in here, we can bring untainted goods and so on. Urgent, almost situationist. Yeah. Urgent situation. Yeah. And that then talking uh, to that community, uh, which basically said, we don't want to go back to where we were. Right. We right. now are a different community. Yeah. Right. And being able to source materials for building and uh, ways of constructing temporary shelters for community activities, for uh, for habitat, mm -hmm. um, in such ways that not only could they not be temporary, they could extend, right. but also it was not just disaster housing, it was not just temporary shelter, mm. it was an architecture. Yeah. which uh, bonded with the needs of a particular group of survivors. Right, right, right. right. And to me, um, one could actually begin to uh, think architecture not just in terms of survival, not just in terms of, uh, you know, sort of catastrophe. Uh, disaster uh, response. Disaster response. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of, 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 uh, of developing uh, material and spatial uh, prototypes for living the disaster. Hmm. Interesting. Living the catastrophe. Living the disaster, living the catastrophe. Which we're in. Yes. Which we're in, whether mm -hmm. we're in Brooklyn, right. or whether in uh, Fukushima, or whether we're in uh, Mumbai. One way to read that is uh, learning to give up the ghost of eventual utopia. Yes. Totally. Uh, I've always resisted that. Yeah. yeah. My interest in utopia, I have to say, my yeah. interest in utopia was sparked uh, in the 70s, or well, the, no, I mean the late 60s and early 70s, uh, in a small group uh, in London with Martin Pawley, the critic, and with others who were, uh, we were absolutely amazed at the hubris of architects who thought that architecture could reconstruct society. Mm hmm the hubris of that kind of utopianism. Sure, yeah. Where architecture was the, right. So my first, eff my first efforts at, at de de sort of um, unpacking right. that particular hubris uh, were Fourier and Ledoux. Uh, right. I don't <laughs> idealize either of them, uh -huh. but I do think that both of them are uh, in some way or another uh, 
keys to the kind of kernel keys to the basic false utopianism of architecture. Mm. What do you mean by that? Kernel? That architecture can const construct and transform society by itself. Right. That right. you put people in the in the unité d'habitation and think they're going to be no, no, no. nice. No, no. But citizens. return to Ledoux and uh, Fourier. I mean, so what are you saying about that? About they are the, they are the theorists of that that uh, kind of thinking of that that of thought that thought yes yes of course of course of course yeah so I'm I'm not someone who you know talks uh, you know in the, in the postmodern era I was mm. always thought of as somebody who talked about the do because I thought he was wonderful visionary yeah well, that's what, what I was you, talking about that's what happens when you write the canonical sort of book on the enlightenment of right architecture. right <laughs> but at the same time my enlightenment is the is deeply um, uh, inflected uh, by Foucault's uh, by Foucault's in uh, enlightenment which right, is right, uh, of course. the dark side of, uh, yeah. of of rationalization and rationalism right so it's uh, Adorno after the Holocaust right. right let's 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 switch gears here so Tony uh, how, how did you get into history and theory in uh, where did you grow up in England uh, Liverpool? No, I'm not thinking. No, no, no. no. I was a, a very um, asthmatic, nerdy, Proustian kind of uh, child in Essex. Okay. Which is a absolutely benighted um, realm. To benighted? The east, benighted realm to the <laughs> east of London. Okay. I'd better explain what benighted means. Our listeners, I don't think it's a term in. <laughs> it's. It, it, uh, it's a lost, it's a it's a lost, forgotten realm that stretches from the outskirts of London to the the marshes of South End. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so you're from the so so out of nowhere. Out of nowhere, I I uh, the one thing about Essex is it's mostly flat. Okay. And the one way to escape my uh, suburban household was a by bicycle. Right. And uh, the bicycle allowed me to to roam, you know, church by church, uh, uh, medieval uh, cottage to medieval cottage. Uh, I I drew, I cataloged, I wrote little books on uh, these uh, churches and there. I did brass rubbings what kind of on churches there. Were what? there. What kind of churches were there? I mean, there was. Like I mean, there's a church in every town. Right. So there's a church in every village, yeah, and sort of everything like from Anglo-Saxon churches to yeah. to Norman churches yeah, to yeah. Gothic churches to okay. Gothic right. revival churches right, uh -huh, uh -huh, in my uh -huh. town. Uh -huh. So, uh, you know, I just got so interested in uh, in, uh, in 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 the historical. Uh, I suppose it was a kind of escape. From where I was in this uh, nasty little suburb, and uh, it was such a an incredible relief to to go with my my uh, my brass rubbing equipment. Uh, brass e rubbing, effigies, okay, okay. Uh, where you where you could you, you could take rubbings. a piece of paper yeah, yeah. and uh, black. Uh, they were set up for rubbings, or you people just did that. Well, you did that. I mean, you, yeah, 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 you, yeah. You hoped that you weren't being. Going to be chased out of the church. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but usually, if you met the priest, he would ask you in. I, I was very interested. Anyway, my my first life was as a medieval historian. Uh, okay, I did not know that. <clears throat> and in fact, um, in my time, you couldn't go. I don't think you can anyway. But you, you couldn't go up to to Cambridge or Oxford or anywhere else. Yeah. And in Cambridge, uh, you certainly couldn't go up to Cambridge to read architecture. You had to go up. To, you had to take an exa your exams for Cambridge in a proper humanistic subject. Uh -huh, right? uh -huh. So my exams for Cambridge. Uh, first of all, there are state exams, yeah. which I got. And yeah. I could have gotten into Cambridge that way, but then I wanted to get to the scholarship level, yeah. and so I, uh, you know, studied for uh, translation in Latin, Greek. Uh, medieval Latin, Anglo-Saxon, Italian, and French. Wow! Um, and then wrote uh, a whole series of papers over a week, staying in Cambridge as a, as a, as a, as a acolyte for Cambridge. Uh -huh. um, on you know the uh, the problem of uh, of the 
the papal successions and the the, dis the papacy's disputes in the 13th and 14th centuries and the the doomsday book and the whatever it was that I was asked right right um, so I got my scholarship in medieval history at uh, to Cambridge uh -huh. I was a major scholar at Emmanuel College okay and um, sw immediately switched from medieval history to architecture because uh, I've wanted to do that all along okay and uh, the first so uh, architectural history or architecture architecture oh okay architecture uh -huh. I'm yeah. a profession I, I was trained yeah, yeah, yeah. for three three years as a uh, uh, RIBA part one, yeah, two yeah, yeah. years uh, at graduate is RIBA part two. Okay. And I was about to go into uh, Sandy Wilson's office to design the uh, British Library b before I came to the States. Right, right, okay. So anyway, so I, I got to Cambridge yeah. and um, Emmanuel College had... No, no, but with this sort of deep interest in medieval churches and so on and this <coughs> history, uh, w w why was the secret plan really to become a RIB? ARIBA or you know well because my father yeah who uh, was uh, someone who never went to university but went through apprenticeships to become uh, he became a major civil servant in the um, in the area of uh, of land and and building um, uh, surveying mm -hmm. uh, but he uh, wanted me to do something practical right and, right right uh, he at one point said, "Well, uh, if you can if you can get a scholarship, that's all fine by me. But if you don't, um, I'm going to send you to the Merchant Navy." And uh, my problem there was that I, you know, I could stand on the shore and see a, a boat going up and down and, and get seasick. So <laughs> this was not a this was not an option. Not an option. Right? <laughs> So like, bloody, I'd better get my air IV. <laughs> I'd better get my, well, get into Cambridge. Anyway. Get into Cambridge. And I wanted to go to Cambridge. I mean, there were three possible schools of architecture at that time. There was the AA, mm -hmm. uh, which was not a university, and I didn't want to, I wanted to go to university. Yeah, yeah. And there was Liverpool, which yeah. was a university, but it was still very, very tightly organized around its post uh, Beaux Arts um, yeah. visions. Yeah. And so uh, Cambridge, which had just been established uh, in 57, 58 by Leslie Martin. Yeah. And Leslie Martin was the first architect to get a PhD in, ar in uh, the history of architecture, you know, uh, the yeah. uh, Spanish Baroque architecture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and he was also head of the RIBA education committee that reformed uh, the educational structure uh -huh, uh -huh. Of, uh, of architects and was given the chair of architecture at Cambridge in order to take this little real estate operation uh -huh. into an architectural operation. All right. And then he brought to to Cambridge a uh, whole series of people, all the uh, all the people as visitors that he had in the circle um, circle uh, just before the war with Ben Nicholson and Nam Gabo and Antoine Pevsner and so uh -huh. on. Uh -huh. Plus uh, Colin St. John Wilson, yeah. with whom he had worked at the um, at the uh, at the LCC ho housing office, right, right, uh, and you know Leslie built the festival of, uh, uh, festival Britain. hall, yeah. but he also was chief architect of the of the LCC, and yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Sandy Wilson had done a whole series of uh, of housing estates, right, right, right. That. So he brought Sandy Wilson, but Sandy Wilson was also. Uh, brought with him as a series of visitors the independent group. Right, right, right. Um, so, so you read with all of them? You studied what? with all of them? So they all came as cri yeah, critics. Yeah, I mean, yeah. uh, Alison and Peter yeah. Smithson, yeah. Uh, uh, Palotti came to, to teach us how to do uh, sculpture, yeah. uh, uh, Henderson uh, in terms of photography. Yeah. I mean, they were part of our group in Cambridge. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, the big shift yeah. towards uh, not just being a medievalist, yeah. but also being an architectural, yeah. uh, was my first visit to Venice oh. um, as a school on a school trip when I was fourteen or fifteen. Yeah. And two things happened: I tasted food for the first time, <laughs> and uh, when I went to the public library uh, to ask for some reading about Venice, uh, the public librarian said, uh, "Well, we, I think we can get you something nice," and they. <laughs> presented me with the folio volume, the three folio volumes of Ruskin's Stones of Venice <laughs> on library, interlibrary loan from uh, Edinburgh University, <laughs> hand painted by Ruskin. Wow. Right. And I just, <laughs> I just devoured this before I went to Venice. Yeah, yeah. And then when I got to Venice, it was magic. Yeah, yeah. And it still is, actually, yeah, yeah. to oh, me. I still sure. have a thing about Venice. Yeah. 
uh, and it rev revived itself through the years with my friendship with Manfredo Tafuri and, mm -hmm. uh, and the School of History there. Yeah. But um, the, that, that, right, that was incredible. So I got into Cambridge and then I had a gap before between like January and uh, October mm -hmm. uh, and I went to Venice mm. and I stayed in Venice in a cheap little pensione right. and I photographed every single and drew every single gothic window that Ruskin had ever thought about. Right, right, right. And so I went up to Cambridge a full Ruskinian. Okay. Right. First day, a note in my box in the manual saying um, I should see my tutor because at Cambridge you have tutors. Yeah, right? yeah. And you meet with your tutor every week yeah. uh, through the terms. And the tutor gives you readings and all kinds of uh, assignments and discussions that uh, gives you a, another level of understanding beyond just the lectures you go to. Yeah, right? yeah. Yeah. So it, the, this little note said, uh, you meet, you're meeting your tutor at, uh, you know, on Friday or something or other, um, and you should telephone him at this number. Yeah. So at nine o'clock in the morning, I telephoned him on my second day at Emmanuel yeah. uh, at that number. And a voice came, no, 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 never, never, never <laughs> before midday. <laughs> I will allow only Mozart to wake me up. So I put it down. It was Colin Rowe. Of course, of course. So for two years, for two years, I met with Colin Rowe on Fridays at five o'clock right, okay. until the martinis ran out at midnight and I had to climb over the wall back into Cambridge. Right? Yeah. Um, and so first time, what are you interested in? What are you interested in? Well, I actually, so I'm very interested in Rusk Ruskin. No, 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 <laughs> not Ruskin. Le Corbusier, Le Corbusier. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that was it. And All the right. second, the second great in influence was that um, arriving with me in 1960 at Cambridge was I was a you know a very very over educated and completely over stimulated um, you know young undergraduate um, and uh, immediately very close to Colin. I mean, Colin and I got on very well in right. because he saw that I was a complete nerd and yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Com you know, was yeah. totally into that. Yeah, yeah. Right? And um, was a young PhD student from yeah. uh, Columbia who just, uh, you know, gone through the Korean War, but come back and then got his Fulbright and came to Cambridge as a PhD student. and. Uh, and he, uh, because he was already a, a, an architect, he had studied at Cornell and, and, uh, and graduated at uh, Columbia, uh, he was uh, given by Sandy Wilson, who had to go at that time, at that moment, to teach at Yale, one of, the, uh, one of, the, uh, one of those visiting positions, he was given the, the first year to teach. I see. Peter Eisen. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh, I see. The destiny <laughs> between Colin and Peter, between Scylla and Charybdis. Yeah, yeah. There I was. There you are. As there this you young are. kid who was uh, <laughs> completely fascinated by abstraction on the one hand yeah. and historical mannerism on the other. Right. And then you came to the U.S. I think Peter Eisenman and why did well, you? Yeah. What happened was that uh, I uh, Peter went to Peter left in in uh, in '63. Mm -hmm. Uh, my then wife typed his thesis and I sort of corrected his footnotes and mm -hmm. we managed to put his thesis in while he was on honeymoon. Uh -huh. And then he um, went to Princeton as a first job yeah. and as an assistant professor. And I was just about to go into Sandy Wilson's office in London because I had worked with him and built the first model for the British Library. Yeah. And he wanted me to take that mm -hmm. on. And uh, when Peter called and said, well, look, we got a, um, a one-year position at Princeton, uh, part half teaching, half research, uh, you want to come over for a year? Yeah. I'd already been there for a long summer in 64, uh, doing my master's thesis in history on McKinley and White in the offices of McKinley and White and looking at their archives. And I just, I thought it was fantastic. New York, to me, was just 
extraordinary. Right. So I said, well, why not? And so I went to Princeton for a year, and 27 years later, I left. <laughs> right, right. Uh, uh, let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, transculturality. Uh, uh, you know, do you think uh, you've become an American? I think um, there's something about I used to talk to um, my friend T.J. Clark, who was uh. a, at Cambridge with me, and yeah. then, uh, and then he also, uh, you know, went to, I think he went to Essex, and then he went to Oxford, and then he went to to Harvard, and mm -hmm. then he went to Berkeley. Yeah. Whether we became American or not, there was something we could do, with what we, with with our, you know, intense desire to, to construct a world of thought right. in, in our in our disciplines in America that we couldn't do in England. Why not? Because of the incredible sort of uh, rigidity and absolute uh, conviction that English institutions had that they were right mm -hmm. and that change really couldn't happen. Un unnecessary, yeah. In, in, I mean, I, when I got to Princeton, I was in, as a, a two years later. I was an assistant professor. I was on the PhD committees. Um, I was uh, involved uh, with Kenneth Franton in the establishment of a history theory curriculum. Mm -hmm. When Ken left in seventy one, seventy two, and I got tenure, I was immediately uh, given the role of the chair of the PhD program that I could then establishes an interdisciplinary program between uh, structures, uh, sociology, history, and theory, um, which then became a model for the MIT program that Stanford uh -huh. Anderson started. Right. Um, it, it, you know, there was something you can do. Right, right, right. I mean, you, in Cambridge, you could... You could no way. No way. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. So you felt like you I were felt a young Turk and, you know, you sort were, of... You were you liberated. Could do, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And also Geddes, um, as a, as the new dean of uh, of uh, of uh, Princeton, yeah. the first dean of Princeton, uh -huh. uh, came with a tremendous sense of the of the value of research, whether it was scientific research, uh, sociological research, or urban research, or historical research. Mm -hmm. He had he wanted to be, in one way or another, I think the the Leslie Martin of uh, of uh, of uh, American education, right? You know, he was in fact head of the the uh, AIA Commission for Reform in the in the sixties. Uh, okay, and uh, he also took advantage of the fact that the Princeton School of Architecture is not, but Princeton doesn't have professional schools. Right, it has two professional schools. It has the School of Architecture and it has the Woodrow Wilson School of Public Affairs. Right, but they're not like Harvard right. professional schools. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are. They are, they are integrated in their fac the faculty of the, those two schools is the faculty of the arts and sciences. Yeah. So it's there's no there's one faculty at Princeton. Right. And there's one uh, provost and one administration. So that the the ability of uh, of being able to bring in a historian to your class in 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 architecture or a historian to bring in you to a class in in history or in uh, anthropology or whatever. Mm -hmm. You can make as uh, first Karl Schorsky and I made, and then I continued uh, um, major interdisciplinary programs right. uh, yeah. with architecture as part of a parcel. Right, right, right. right. Uh, I, I, in the School of Architecture, we most of my first uh, uh, PhD uh, students, who are now teaching everywhere, from right. Mary McLeod to Pat Morton, yeah. are you know were involved in in, in getting the first melon. Uh, uh, grants to bring interdisciplinary right. uh, people. We were the first per people to give Gayatri Spivak. The English department wouldn't invite Gayatri Spivak to, oh, really? to Princeton <laughs> yeah. at that point in, yeah, in yeah, the seventies. Yeah. No yeah. way. Yeah, she no. came. To, she came and lectured in the in the in the in Betts Hall in the, in the architecture school. Really? Yes. In the seventies. Yes. When she was translating of grammatology. Yes. No. Because we were the theory group. Really, we were the people that were allowed. The, the architecture was the center right. for our, uh, because of myself, yeah. uh, Ken Frampton, sure, and then sure. uh, uh, Gunter Nitschke, who yeah. came from Japan, yeah. was a German, uh, but uh, tremendously interested in in ritual mm. and in and Japanese architecture. 
he taught with me for many years at Princeton. Right. Um, and uh, uh, there was a there was a, a tremendous interest in history that was not art history. Right. 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 Yeah. Uh, that was Different. a fight that we had to fight, uh, and eventually, I think, has now been uh, resolved. But it right. took a long time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that's a fascinating narrative. We I did not know that. An extraordinary community of intellectuals. There. Yeah, in the seventies. Yeah. At Princeton. Well, yeah. yeah. Because we had uh, we had uh, Karl Strzelski, cultural historian. Yeah. Amazing. Anna Mayer, yeah. political historian. Yeah. Um, and then younger faculty came in, like uh, like Tony Grafton, and right. uh, we have Bob Danton. Mm. They were all interested in architecture. And, right, and, right. Right. They brought into the history department. They brought a whole slew of of uh, of, uh, of uh, French historians uh, from the sixième section: uh, Mona Ozouf, Jacques Ozouf, uh, a whole range of of, uh, of French uh, intellectuals. Uh, who were involved in this post-structuralist uh, right. movement? Yeah, uh, you know the history department didn't bring Foucault. Right, right. I so see. It, it 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 was it was uh, a, a moment where architecture was uh, able to be the agent of of an interdisciplinary discourse. Mm. Fascinating. And uh, where. Uh, because of my relationships with France, uh, Kenneth's relationships with uh, with Britain, uh, Getty's relationships with the American community, um, it just it just took off. Yeah. It was extraordinary. Um, so and, so I, and I and I what I'm trying to intimate because when I usually talk about this to students, they say, "Well, uh, I don't think it's ever stopped." Right. In different ways, it has continued in different forms. Uh, in different uh, relationships to different disciplines, uh, architecture has always been the interdisciplinary discipline. Right. And uh, and and universities who uh, have schools of architecture that can, in one way, both assimilate and generate uh, these interdisciplinary uh, uh, threads uh, have always been, you know. I mean, I, I think, you know, it was interesting because when I got to Princeton, there was a wonderful old French um, uh, teacher, uh -huh. uh, Jean Labatou, uh, who was uh, a Beaux-Arts uh, graduate who had uh, very, very strong modernist tendencies. And so he left France, went to Havana, actually. He, he planned uh, the waterfront uh, for Havana and then came to Princeton in the 20s and took over the school of the Department of Architecture graduate program and taught Venturi, uh, Moore, uh, Turnbull, uh -huh. and a whole slew of students, both architecture in the, in, in the Beaux-Arts compositional sense, right. in, the historical, uh, in the historical sense, uh -huh. uh, but at the same time totally convinced that modernity uh, was important. Right. Brought Le Corbusier to talk at Princeton uh -huh, uh, uh -huh. in the late twenties. Yeah. Um, was architect of that extraordinary uh, multinational uh, fountain in different colors um, at the World's Fair in right. thirty. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. right. Yeah. Um, and he was the architect of that. I see. And right. so he was both. Right. Right. That's why, for example, Charles Moore did his thesis at Princeton on water. I see. I see. Yeah. Interesting. Anyway, so the Princeton was already ready for that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah but uh, but it happened. So let let <laughs> let's return to this. Your what you're saying that this this is the sort of notion of architecture as the sort of cross disciplinary space of discourse and thinking. Right. Uh, it has never stopped. Where is it going, or where would you like okay. to see it go? Let me let me give a, a little. Um, I think there were there were there were two problems. Yeah. In this. One was that there were, as long as the the different uh, disciplinary threads, uh, the different interconnections were kept in suspension in relationship to design and in relationship to the organization. Of what do you mean in suspension? 
Well, that they didn't come down and I am going to be a sociological architect or oh, I'm going okay. to be a That's semiological a, yeah, architect. Yeah, they didn't become dogmatic. I'm going to be a Foucauldian yeah. architect, yeah, 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 right? Yeah, yeah. That they were kept in suspension as an intellectual, as the febrile intellectual... Uh, Firmament kind of the matrix. Brain, yeah, the yeah. brain of architecture, yeah, 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 if you want, yeah. as opposed to the ideology. The, the, mm. the ideology of architecture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then I think we were in great shape. Right. The minute that semiology became a discipline to solve architecture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or that Foucault became a discipline to to see architecture only as a surveillance problem. Right. Or, um, and so on. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. The, the minute that the different discourses uh, were separated from each other in conversation right. to become authorizations for a particular kind of architecture. As right, opposed to right. That, then I think there's a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. And do you think that just happened? As, just as if sci a, a certain scientific or high-tech or yeah. technological right. aspiration right. or a programmatic uh, Chris Alexander operation, right? right? That they all bifurcated, yeah. right? And that, I think, is, is, is still a problem. I think you do your, uh, it sounds to me like you're describing the 80s and... Uh, Probably. Uh, yes, right. yes, yes. And it's still a problem, right? Yeah, I think so. Um, but uh, I'm describing what what we would normally call postmodern, but I think postmodern is completely the wrong notion to, to describe it. It's the wrong descriptor. Uh, it's all modern. Yeah, but it's, yeah, yeah. it's the way modernity uh, sets its sights on a particular uh, investment strategy uh, and invests in semiology or invests in, or brand. And, and so investment and branding and how you brand your architecture becomes a kind of uh, a, discur a, a, dis a narrowing of discourse. Mm. Mm. And, and so you're seeing postmodernism conventionally thought as sort of the semiotic branding, semiotic uh, you know representational strategy as a kind of a particular ideological branding well, of I, modernism. I, I, I think that the name postmodern, which Charles, my friend Charles, the late yeah. lamented Charles, who's a very was a very good friend. Um, I I always felt that that he because he was trained, you know, by um, you know, Bannum was trained by Pevsner, he was trained by Bannum. Mm. They they all were trained in an art historical mode of right. having to label something. Mm. And to label something kills it, right? And it actually kills it as a um, as a thought process, right? Right. So I don't. I, don't, I agree. I yes, don't want to think of. I don't think of uh, Frank Gehry and and uh, and uh, Venturi and I don't want to think of them as not contemporary, as not modern. I mean, they they are all part of. You know, Peter Eisman is as much postmodern as anybody else. Sure. Sure. Right? Right. I mean, if 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 you think of postmodern as as an art historical identification of something after what art history has already called modernism, yeah, yeah, which is crazy anyway. Yeah, because if you're talking about modernism, you're talking about the most incredibly small aspect of uh, or the, the tiny aspect of what happened in the twenties and thirties. I mean, are you are you going to talk about modernism and Tessinoff? Are you going to yeah, talk yeah, about yeah, modernism yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, and Touts? Uh, yeah. The notion of the modern movement, the notion of modernism, the mm. motion, and and the way in which they've all become crystallized in courses, mm, right? Uh, theory you, courses, mm -hmm. which autonomize. Mm. We, you know, these poor graduate students that have to read Deleuze without having a com single notion that Deleuze on the fold is talking about Leibniz. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know how. How can you know that's okay if, if you're a philosopher if you have some kind of in intercepted mm. philosophy? Yeah, yeah. But but to just take it as a as, as a diagram that allows allows you to to play with curves in uh, in parametric uh, yeah. formation, I, it's, it's, it's nothing to do with uh, more, yeah, yeah. that. So I'm against the autonomization yeah. of these strands of thinking. Right. But you said once uh, earlier in our conversation we we we. we We've resolved our quarrel, or whatever you want to call it, with art history. You, know, you seem like right. you seem to suggest that we have kind of got beyond that. What did you mean by that? Did you say that? Oh, I, I, uh, I still feel that 
the relationships between architectural history as a discipline and mm. art history as a discipline mm. um, are problematic. Right. Yes. Uh, that's, that's all I can say. I mean, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. there right. are art historians who overcome the problematic and there are architectural historians who overcome the problematic. Right. But um, in relationship to someone like myself who is trained as an architect right. and who think like an architect, um, in relationship to all the questions that architecture has to ask, yeah. uh, the isolation of those aesthetically or in temporal periodization mm. or in stylistic formations or in um, in uh, in any way mm -hmm. um, cuts up the the possibility of thinking holistically about it, right. even the building, right. Okay, as we move towards the end over here, so, um, um, you know, having now s stepped down as dean at Cooper Union and, 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 and traveling between several institutions, uh, what, what are you working on now? What are, what's on your, on your keyboard or, you know, uh, what, what's, what's keeping you awake? What keeps me awake is um, all the questions that uh, my students ask me. <laughs> uh, that's the one thing, <laughs> right. um, and I can never actually resolve or solve how they, uh, to any extent of, and I don't want to resolve those questions. Right. Those are questions that are legitimately asked, right, right, and legitimately should remain questions. Right, right. right. Um, I've never in my life ever set out to write a book, so I write always on. Uh, invitation, stimulation, and uh, and pressure. Uh -huh. So, uh, somebody asked me to do something as an article or as a commentary. I, I always resist. I say I can't. I know nothing about this. I, I can't do this. Yeah. And then I say, okay, well, maybe I'll do it. And and eventually, after several deadlines are missed, I will produce the article. Uh -huh. Over a period of years, sometimes three or four years, sometimes five years. Uh, with uh, the 18th century, it was like 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, I seem, I look back on what I've written and published and think, you know, there's something that unifies these, uh, these different articles or these different things, which is what I was interested in at that moment. Right. Whether it was uh, 18th century enlightenment, whether it was uh, just investigating this strange character, Ledoux. Uh-huh. Which I still haven't, I still haven't pinned him down. Whether it was investigating the incredible, uh, uh, trying to decipher the extraordinary handwriting on thousands and thousands of pieces of paper that Charles Fourier uh, uh, produced in his archive. Yeah. Uh, whether it was uh, in contact with uh, uh, people in Princeton who were deeply involved in, you know, a kind of post-Freudian. Lacanian discourse of uh, psychoanalysis and uh, trying to test out whether or not there was something in architectural discourse, uh, certainly in textual discourse, uh, that resonated. Uh, and why was it that uh, Freud's case studies were always, always based on short stories? Uh -huh. And why are those short stories about uh, spaces and uh, and uh, and Roman ruins uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or whether it was uh, trying to come to grips with uh, the technological uh, revolution of parametrics and the and the strange forms that were emerging out of that in terms of spatial structures that were certainly not the spatial structures of rationalism that I had become uh, attuned to and taught to, to design yeah. um, in warp space or, or yeah. whether it was uh, a series of reflections on the different historians and critics that had influenced me in my life. Mm -hmm. all, those, all those books mm -hmm. uh, came out of a series of articles that suddenly seemed to me, not suddenly, maybe over a year, teasing out the relationships among them uh, were formed into a book. Right, right. So what right. I'm doing now uh -huh. is I'm writing articles and hoping that in the next uh, the dots few will connect. years, there's some thread which is about uh, X, uh, some some thread, which is about the uh, the notion of post uh, atomic, post war, post Second World War, um, uh, architectural um, uh, thought mm -hmm. and practice, um, which 
uh, has unified certainly uh, a lot of the articles I've published in the last four or five years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, uh, questions of bombing, questions of ruins, questions of uh, memory, questions of uh, dystopia, questions of, uh, of, uh, of uh, a, a fear. Uh, of trauma, yeah. of uh, post-atomic trauma. Yeah. Uh, so you know, at one moment, yeah. I'm sure uh, I will find a, a way of bringing those articles into some form. Ideally, I want them to be a kind of repast, or if you like, a a conclusion or a continuation. Let's say nothing's ever concluded. Uh -huh. um, in the same way that Bannum's theories and design in the first machine age was a response to the refusal of his professor Pevsner's to go beyond 1914 mm -hmm. and so he went to 1939. Yeah. I don't find a work of theory uh, of, let's take out the word theory, of architectural thought right. in relationship to post-World War II, post-atomic conditions, post-nuclear, post-Holocaust conditions, uh -huh. uh, that touches those architects and theorists and thinkers about architecture uh, in the same way that Bannum touched the theorists and thinkers about architecture uh, from the First World War to the Second World War. Okay. So I hope, uh -huh. in, a, in a way, that it will be a continuation, if you like, of, uh, of work, not about the architects of uh, postmodernism or the architects of the post-war, right. but about architecture right. post-war. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Well, we will look forward to that. I do too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank but, you for it. I hope it never finishes anyway. So. I hope it never finishes anyway. It will never finish. Thank you for the conversation. Thank you for all your work and your friendship, Tony. It's been such a pleasure. Me too. Thank you for listening to Architecture Talk. This is your producer, Mary Lee. We hope you enjoyed the conversation, and if you did, please subscribe and rate us on iTunes or Spotify. We would also love to hear from you if you have any suggestions on new topics or guests. You can always reach out to us on our website, Facebook, or Instagram. Thanks again, and until next time, this is Architecture Talk.